Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapurski, and the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of our consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And I'm joined by Vishal. Vishal, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me uh, on the show. Big fan sure. of what you guys have done in the past, so I'm um, excited to be here. Uh, I'm Vish, uh, Vishal Vish, I go by Vish, um, CEO Vish. and co-founder of SoWork. Um, mm -hmm. So we build uh, uh, virtual workplaces for teams, and uh, we do a few things to help uh, teams feel more connected and more productive. So um, and we, we can get into that in, in the show, but one of the mm -hmm. things I'm really excited about lately is uh, we've been building these bots that kind of you can deploy into into people's virtual workplaces and help them do their, their work in a more productive way. Um, mm -hmm. And separately, uh, I'm an emergency resident, emergency doctor. And so I do mm -hmm. a, a month or two of medicine each year. Excellent. Well, let's talk about this virtual workspace. Now, what do you find to be just the generally the benefits? Like why would somebody who is doing remote work or hybrid work want a virtual office space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Like um, you, uh, it, it seems like a new thing to some people. Um, but but there's a few reasons that we consistently see customers and, and people who are kind of just trying it out. There's a few reasons we see them want to try this out. And it's because mm -hmm. when um, uh, remote work hit and uh, when, when the pandemic hit and teams kind of all had to go remote, we started to feel disconnected in ways that we haven't really felt mm -hmm. uh, disconnected before. And so to give you kind of the, the founding story, uh, because this is this is how it all happened. It happened to my team. My team was on campus at Harvard building a totally different type of software initially. This was before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And um, we were building a machine learning for, for education. That was kind of the, our, our prior software. Mm -hmm. And I picked everybody off campus, March 2020. Something mm -hmm. happened then. I don't know if you remember, but, you know, mm -hmm. some, I don't know what, what it was. But anyway, Harvard kicked us off campus. And we were all kind of spread out all over Boston. And, you know, it was fine for a little while. We used Slack and we used Zoom and, mm -hmm. you know, it was okay. But um, over time, you know, the team that that I'd worked so hard to to kind of build and, and connect with, um, we started feeling like we were drifting apart. And mm -hmm. so um, that wasn't really the type of team or the type of company that I set out to build. I wanted to build something mm -hmm. that was really well connected because I think, you know, building a startup or building a company is really a... Um, it, it's supposed to be a journey where you you build it with people that you you care about and mm -hmm. um, and you you have like you know a great outcome together for your customers sure. as well as you know for the team who's working so hard on it day in day out. But what happened and this happened to thousands, millions, maybe I don't, I don't actually know, but um, at least hundreds of thousands of teams around the world when the pandemic hit, they started to feel like super disconnected from their workplaces. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a problem mm -hmm. introduced, um, you know, by the distance uh, and it wasn't solved by Slack and Teams and, and Zoom and, and softwares like that. So I kind of racked my brain for months for the times in my life that I felt the most connected to people, despite being across long distances. Mm -hmm. And one memory kept coming back to me over and over. And that was when I used to play World of Warcraft when mm -hmm. I was like 18 years old. And have you played that game? Are you familiar with World of Warcraft? Yeah. Yeah, super nerdy, I know. But, um, you know, we, we did some soul searching and kind of asked ourselves, well, why did we feel so connected? You know, I met my current CTO playing World of Warcraft. I met oh. one of our investors. I met one of our product people and one of our designers mm -hmm. playing World of Warcraft. So so what was it about that? And so um, we decided to kind of go out on a limb and try to replicate some of the things that we felt and, and experienced in, in the user experience of that game, but apply it Rich, to our... You want to create your own guild? Exactly, exactly, right? The guild being our startup. And and so mm -hmm. we built it and we built a little prototype. And, you know, within weeks, we could, we were just transformed as a team because we were able to come together again. It wasn't Slack or Zoom where things are async and you have to schedule things all the time. Instead, um, we were able to come together uh, as a team despite being across um, distances. And so um, instantly, almost, the, the culture of our team started returning to what we were trying to build in the first place. Mm -hmm. And when we started to tell our peers about it, you know, the different cohorts we were all in at Harvard, they all wanted to try it for their teams as well. Hey, can we get like our own guild, our own workspace, our own sort of game world for us to work together in? And what we saw was that 
they were able to make decisions much faster on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. They were able to remove wasted time from their calendars. They were able to feel much more connected as a team. All the things that you need to help your team thrive, especially in market conditions like we have um, today. Right. So anyway, that, that was kind of the um, the initial how and the why of, of why it happened and, and how we started to build so work. And um, since then, we've just seen that replicated over and over um, through the last couple of years. Now, I know that there are several other companies in the virtual workspace, the mm -hmm. virtual office space. What makes so work unique compared and different compared to the other companies in the space? Yeah, and it's a great question. There's a few things. Um, there's, uh, uh, I guess, one of the biggest ones is um, our our raison d'être, like our reason for even being uh, a company, what why we build mm. what we build. And I think that's really, when it comes down to it, one of the most fundamental differences or core differences that you can have between companies that maybe predict how the company will um, will do and how the company will, more importantly, solve the user problem. Right, because mm -hmm. you know, if you're not solving a customer problem, then you're not sure. going to do well in the in the long term. Sometimes in the short term. So you know, some of our competitors were um, created to host birthday parties or you know, like baby showers and and things like that, and and that's fine. Some of our competitors were um, founded for uh, events and like other other types of events, conferences, etc., and mm -hmm. and that's fine too. What we were um, founded for is specifically workplace. Um, mm. You know, it's in our name. So work actually means social online work. So work, and so um, we were we were founded to solve problems that remote teams and distributed teams, hybrid teams would have um, mm -hmm. when when trying to, you know, not necessarily only rekindle, but rekindle the benefits of being in a physical office when they mm -hmm. were together but also um, stepping it up to the next level and saying, okay, well, now that the office is digital and not just physical, what can we do? Like imagine how you can supercharge what happens in a, in a workplace if you do that. And so lots of examples I can give you about what we're able to do for teams, but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Or that's, that's one of the main reasons about why we're different. And that kind of um, leads into all of the implementation sort of execution mm -hmm. reasons we're different. Now, I work with a number of companies to help them figure out their return to office strategy, to figure out the remote work strategy, hybrid work strategy. And mm -hmm. I do tell them about virtual offices. Mm -hmm. And a number of companies are reluctant to try them because they feel it's just going to be an extra tool that they have to learn. And they don't want to like click their avatars and make them move around. And they feel it's kind of like a little bit hokey. Yeah. What do you do to get over this resistance? Like, what have you found useful? when you are trying to convince leaders to even try a virtual office? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, uh, and this maybe comes from my um, medical training, is that it's it's hard to convince somebody of something if they don't think they have a problem, mm -hmm. you know? And so if, if, if they don't think they have a problem, we're not really in the business of convincing. Instead, um, we're happy to be there for the people who know what a big existential problem actually if you look at a long enough time scale time horizon um, this could be for their company i.e the problems with uh their employees being checked out the um the the um benefits that they're missing out on um that could be had with something that connects their team in a way that helps them be more productive everybody's kind of after a better bottom line and there's just softwares out there that are new since the pandemic hit, ours being one of them, that leaders don't necessarily all know about yet. And, and yeah. so the, the way I think about it is, this is just another uh, example of crossing the chasm where mm. you've got the early adopters and they understand the problem and you'll resonate mm. with them and that's great. What's going to happen is they're going to see such a big benefit um, to virtual workplaces, and maybe you've you know you could read our G two reviews, or you could you know look look up you know how people feel about really good virtual offices, mm -hmm. see the benefits um, for yourself. Maybe the audience or who's listening, um, you can also look that up and kind of you'll you'll see, or you can try it out for yourself. But mm -hmm. the people who are kind of after the chasm in that graph, the crossing the chasm graph, um, mm -hmm. they will eventually see, oh my gosh, like maybe they're onto something. 
and and mm. wow this is how it will affect my business and oh my gosh like how could we possibly do without this because look at all the, the benefits mm. that we get that are different from the physical office that we could never get in real life so there's mm. actually only one way to run uh, a company in 2023 and beyond which is um, having having a really um, uh, uh, useful virtual office that can help to just fundamentally change how your team works and you said at the beginning of the show that you're introducing generative AI into how cell work functions. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you're seeing as the benefits of doing so? Yeah, sure. So our um, our kind of AI plan, so again, my team's background is in AI, um, particularly mm -hmm. machine learning, natural language, computer vision. Um, the company that we were building before cell work uh, was, you know, pretty hardcore deep tech um, uh, machine learning company. And so it's been kind of our pleasure to um, to take the learnings that we've had for the last several years and apply them to solve uh, real business problems in the, in the workplace space, the future of work space. So the way that I like to think about conceptually our AI uh, strategy is in kind of three phases. So one phase is actually, sorry, let me go back a step. Three phases, yes, but the goal overall is to say, okay, well, how do we help teams be more productive and more connected to each other? Because it's not just about um, squeezing productivity out of people. I think that's like a terrible way to to think about or run a company if that's all you're thinking. About. You know what I mean? Like if that's yeah. a byproduct of running a really nice, healthy team, then awesome, totally you should do that. And so um, the the first kind of phase, and like I said, the three phases, is um, can we do really simple things like summarize meetings for people so nobody has to do that work? Can we generate action items for people so that nobody has to do that work? And then auto export all those action items mm -hmm. to Asana or to Jira or wherever people are doing their task management. So great, every meeting that happens in a SoWork office now, um, you, you toggle it on, but every meeting that happens in a SoWork space, you'll get your summary, You'll get all your action items for each person on the team, and then those can get mm -hmm. auto ticketed to the right people in your task management software. Nobody has to do that job, and all the people are on the same page at the end of that meeting. Mm -hmm. um, what that then creates is a, um, a repo of basically every meeting that's happened in your office, and all the mm -hmm. people who have access or authorized sort of authorized access to 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 look at all of that gets to go and look at the codex of your your meeting library. That could mm -hmm. be admins that could be all your teammates if you're a super open transparent team um so everybody can see a record of everything that's happened all the meetings like you can't do that in a physical office that's just one sure. of the things right and so what that does is leads into phase two of, of the three phases which is um you can now ask a bot uh, you can name your bot you can put your company logo on it you can make it humanoid you can make it a bear you can make it whatever it is that you you want to make it but a bot that's in your office that um, you can just ask natural language questions to. You can say, hey, um, ours in our office, her name is Sophia. So Sophia means wisdom in Greek. So you can say, hey, Sophia, um, what uh, what work is being shipped this week? And then she'll say, oh, well, based on all these meetings and all this work and the stuff that happened in GitHub and the stuff that happened in Asana and the stuff that happened in Notion and et cetera, these things are all getting shipped. These ones are behind. Okay, that's great. Hey, Sophia, what's like, uh, are we going to make our revenue projections for uh, Q1 2024? Well, based on the sales that are coming in in Salesforce and based on this and that and these meetings, um, yeah, we're actually going to make them. But uh, we're, uh, I don't know, we're, we're lagging behind for Q2 based on the projections that you talked about in this town hall three months mm. ago. Or whatever. So you're able to ask these um, natural language questions that, that's how people interact mm -hmm. and that's how people want their information sort of gotten and given. And so, um, so that, that's phase two. And then phase three, I, we, we can't really talk about it yet, but um, what I will say about it is that um, there's a lot of uh, existential dread, let me call it that, um, by the average employee in, in many professions um, mm -hmm. that they're going to lose their job because of AI or that their hours are gonna be cut because of AI. And what we have figured out is a way to um, help to ensure that these folks become a part of that AI future and can mm -hmm. take a piece of ownership, a piece of earnings. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, how do I walk the line here? 
I guess the way I can sum it up is phase three is about helping folks who may feel like they're at risk participate mm -hmm. in uh, the economy of AI that that mm -hmm. will displace a lot of people. Okay, that sounds, that sounds exciting. Now, as we finish up the interview, what do you think will be the future of remote work, including this use of generative AI, and how will so work be a part of the future of remote work? Yeah, um, I think the future of remote work is really interesting. It, it's not something that started with the pandemic, right? And I think probably mm -hmm. readers, sorry, sure. listeners of your show know that, you know, this happened you know, remote work has been a thing for decades. Sure. And then pandemic happened, it got super accelerated and we haven't come back to previous, um, mm -hmm. the slope has been permanently increased in terms yeah. of companies that are thinking about it, particularly in this kind of market, um, economic market, where more and more companies are opting to never even think about having a physical office because mm -hmm. they'd rather save that money and spend it on staff or marketing yeah. or growth or whatever it happens to be. It just makes a ton of sense. And, and we're seeing that too. The um, the way that we think about the future of remote work is it's gonna continue. The slope is gonna still mm -hmm. increase and companies who um, who don't kind of adapt and say, okay, you know, maybe physical only isn't the way, um, we think they're gonna be left behind. Uh, and for a number of reasons, maybe like the quick sort of cliff notes about why we think that is because the types of people who help to push companies forward, you kind of need a, a blend of people. You need the creatives, mm -hmm. you need the guardians, you need the stalwarts, you need a whole range of personalities um, to push any company forward. But what what we see, and this is kind of, um, there's a study, uh, gosh, I can't remember who did the, I, I can maybe send it to you after the show, but um, showed that you know people who uh, have a more creative or flexible outlook to life are more likely to choose remote um, mm -hmm. as, as their way that they work. And so if every if any creative, a lot of these are engineers, a lot of these are designers, a lot of these are artists, et cetera, these are crucial, crucial people to for any functioning business in 2024. So um, where everything is technology. You know, if these people are given an option between working remote, or having the option to work flexibly versus being in an office, all other things being equal, they're gonna choose, or at least a vast majority of them are gonna choose the flexible option. Yeah. And what happens on, again, a long enough time horizon is that these people start drifting away from physical companies and mm -hmm. moving toward remote companies. What mm -hmm. happens for those physical companies is then they become less and less competitive over the long haul because they don't have the creatives and that's a, sure. that's a bad thing. And so, um, you know, again, that's that's why we think that remote is is going to be the way and is going to get even stronger. Hybrid is its own beast, and I think it mm -hmm. deserves its own sort of section of discussion. I know we don't have much time, but uh, but yeah, I guess the other the other uh, pillars is that remote work will be a lot more data driven because you can mm -hmm. do that in remote work with the, the digital office, for example. There's um, things that your your uh, your office can do. Um, that your physical office can't like, you know, your, mm -hmm. your digital office can crunch numbers for you. It can run automations. It can talk to your customers. It can help you make sales. It can connect you with your teammates, right? Mm -hmm. It can do all sorts of things that a physical office just can't. And so that's going to be a big part of the future of remote work is just a lot more data-driven approach to building a business. Um, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the other piece is, uh, just different types of technological access, so uh, today, I don't think the world is ready for the Vision Pro workplace um, by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. Wearing two pounds on your head for more than 20 minutes is going to be really harmful to most people. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's long-term issues. I, haven't, I don't think anybody has that data or the medical studies haven't been done on that yet. But uh, from an intuitive perspective, I don't think that's uh, going to work or a, a, a psychological perspective, that's not going to work. So um, basically what we need to do from a remote work perspective is to say, okay, well, how good can we make the software um, on existing devices that help to bond mm -hmm. teams, help to connect teams, because that's going to be better for them and it's going to be better for the bottom line and it's going to be better for the environment and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But how do we keep our eyes to the future and make sure that these remote work tools are compatible with the future technologies? Um, we do mm -hmm. things in a particularly um, um, compatible way, I'll say, under the yeah. hood. Um, that make us compatible with a lot of these 3D devices right off the mm. bat. 
Um, but uh, we can we can get into that if we have time. Excellent. Well, thank you, Vish. This was very helpful, and I really appreciate you sharing your vision. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show, and it helps us improve the show.